Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Invisible Monsters by Chuck Palahniuk. This is one of his earlier ones from what I can tell, I mean in the also by the same author, there's only sort of three or four books listed. Um, I'm just going to read you the blurb, I'm going to go through and check out my tabs and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I will say that I've been reading this on the exercise bike at the gym and I started it today and I'm on page 16, so I've not got a huge amount for you now, um, but again, I will update you after my next exercise. <laughs> Dane reads. She's a catwalk model who has everything, a boyfriend, a career, a loyal best friend. But when a sudden motor accident leaves her disfigured and incapable of speech, she goes from being the beautiful centre of attention to being an invisible monster, so hideous that no one will acknowledge she exists. Enter Brandy Alexander, Queen Supreme, one operation away from being a real woman who will teach her that reinventing yourself means erasing your past and making up something better, and that salvation hides in the last place you'll ever want to look. The narrator must exact revenge upon Evie, her best friend and fellow model, kidnap man her two-timing ex-boyfriend and hit the road with Brandy in search of a brand new past, present and future. And I will say, this drops you right in it. Like, I had no idea what was going on as soon as we started. Um, we have a dedication here for Jeff who said, this is how to steal drugs. And Ina who said, this is lip liner. And Janet who said, this is silk Georgette. And my editor Patricia who kept saying, this is not good enough. So chapter one, I want to read you the opening paragraph here because this is one hell of an opening paragraph. It certainly makes you want to read on to find out more, you know. Where you're supposed to be is some big West Hills wedding reception in a big manor house with flower arrangements and stuffed mushrooms all over the house. This is called scene setting, where everybody is, who's alive, who's dead. This is Evie Cottrell's big wedding reception moment. Evie is standing halfway down the big staircase in the manor house foyer, naked inside what's left of her wedding dress, still holding her right. And this tells us a lot about our narrator. Um, they say, it's not that I'm some detached lab animal just conditioned to ignore violence, but my first instinct is maybe it's not too late to dab club soda on the blood stain, because that's supposed to be a way to clear up blood not not that I know that <laughs> and um it continues from here, which I quite liked as well. Most of my adult life so far has been me standing on seamless paper for a raft of books per hour, wearing clothes and shoes, my hair done and some famous fashion photographer telling me how to feel. Him yelling, give me lust, baby, flash. Give me malice, flash. Give me detached existentialist ennui, flash. Give me rampant intellectualism as a coping mechanism. And it, this thing's just full of great lines. Like, uh, another thing is no matter how much you think you love somebody, you'll step back when the pool of their blood edges up too close. And here we learn some more about Brandy's character. She opens one of her huge ring beaded hands and she touches the hole pouring her blood all over the marble floor. Brandy, she says, shit, there's no way the Bon Marche will take the suit back. So our narrator, she says, beauty is power the same way money is power, the same way a gun is power. Anymore, when I see the picture of a 20-something in the newspaper who was abducted and sodomized and robbed and then killed, and here's a front-page picture of her young and smiling, instead of me dwelling on this being a big, sad crime, my gut reaction is, wow, she'd be really hot if she didn't have such a big honker of her nose. My second reaction is, I'd better have some good head and shoulder shots handy in case I get, you know, abducted and sodomized to death. My third reaction is, well, at least that cuts down on the competition. And she's talking about how she's telling her story. Um, she says, no matter how careful you are, there's going to be the sense you miss something. The collapsed feeling under your skin that you didn't experience at all. There's that fallen heart feeling that you rushed right through the moments when you should have been paying attention. Well, get used to that feeling. That's how your whole life will feel someday. And so they've hatched upon this, uh, this, this scam. And we have like our core group of characters and they're going around basically touring houses that are for sale so that they can steal the drugs that the, the house owners have got. Um, so we get this, for example, inside the next bottle are the little purple ovals of 2.5 milligram size Premarin. That's short for pregnant mare urine. That's short for thousands of miserable horses in North Dakota and Central Canada, forced to stand in cramped dark stalls with a catheter stuck on them to catch every drop of urine and only getting let outside to get fucked again. What's funny is that describes pretty much any good long stay in a hospital, but that's only been my experience. And this was interesting. Um, I don't know if this is true, but it makes sense. Jump to another detective, the one who'd searched my car for the slug and bone fragments, that stuff. The detective saw how I'd been driving with the window half open. A car window, this guy tells me over the 8x10 glossies of me wearing a white sheet. A car window should always be all the way open or shut. He couldn't remember how many motorists had seen decapitated by windows in car accidents. She's talking about her, um, her boyfriend before the accident. Um, we went sailing one time and he wore a speedo. And any smart woman should know that means bisexual at least. Which, okay, that probably makes sense. Uh, but we actually learned later on, he, he works in Vice and he was like the bait. So he would go out and stand around looking like a male prostitute and then they, his, his colleagues, his fellow cops would then go and arrest the Johns, you know? 
So, um, the, our, our protagonist, Matt Brandy, um, when they were both in the hospital and Brandy was having speech therapy to help her sound more like a woman because she's transgender. And I just thought this was fascinating. Uh, the speech therapist says, keep your glottis partially open as you speak. It's the way Marilyn Monroe sang happy birthday to President Kennedy. It makes your breath bypass your vocal cords for a more feminine, helpless quality. Cracking little one line, well it's two lines, but panicking by yourself is the same as laughing alone in an empty room. You feel really silly. And she goes out in public and obviously she's disfigured after this accident. And someone goes, was that a mask? Christ, it's a bit early for Halloween. Which I thought was funny because I read, th read that on Halloween while on the exercise bike at the gym. So more pearls of wisdom from the speech therapist. Men, the therapist says, stress the adjective when they speak. The therapist says, for instance, a man would say, you are so attractive today. A woman would say, you are so attractive today. You gotta to stress the modifier, not the adjective. And our narrator, she asks her friend Evie, why is it dogs lick themselves? Just because they can, Evie says. Yeah, fair enough. So we learn a little bit more about Manus and what he, you know, his, uh, posing as a homosexual well it's there i don't think it's made clear actually whether or whether or not he actually is homosexual but um he has to for his work anyway at home in my apartment i'd have manners with his magazines his guy on guy porno magazines he had to buy for his job he'd say over breakfast every morning he'd show me glossy pictures of guys self-sucking curled up with their elbows hooked behind their knees and cramming their necks to choke on themselves each guy would be lost in his own little closed circuit you can bet almost every guy in the world tried this then Manus would tell me, this is what guys want. Give me romance. Evie says, I'm getting my gooch pierced. It's that little ridge of skin running between your asshole and the bottom of your vagina. But it's spelled differently to how I'd spell it. It's spelled here G-U-I-C-H-E. And I've always spelled it G-O-O-C-H. Seth has a great quote that is also very true. The only reason why we ask other people how their weekend was is so we can tell them about our own weekend. We get a reference to sweet potatoes under a layer of marshmallows as a Thanksgiving food. I've heard that before to a Brit like myself. That's a very weird dish. That's a uniquely American dish. And um, her parents are like obsessed with gay culture because her, her brother Shane died. Um, so they're sitting having their Thanksgiving dinner and dad asks, do you know about rimming? And fisting, my mum asks. Would you pass the butter please, my mother says. To my father she says, do you know what felching is? Later on we get. Felching, I lower my voice, I'm calm now. Felching is when a man fucks you up the butt without a rubber. He shoots his load and then plants his mouth on your anus and sucks out his own warm sperm, plus whatever lubricant and feces are present. That's felching. It may or may not, I add, include kissing you to pass the sperm and fecal matter into your mouth. And then her father clears his throat. I think fletching is the word your mother meant. He says, it means to slice the turkey into very thin strips. I say, oh, I say, sorry, we eat. So we get this kind of, they're talking about um, the going up the space needle and like visions of what the future would look like that come to us from the past. Um, and there's a mention of the Frug, which I didn't know was a real thing. I know a song called the Frug by a band called Rilo Kylie, um, but I thought they'd just made the Frug up. So anyway, jump to the sad moment when we buy our tickets and get on the big glass elevator that slides at the middle of the space needle. We're in this glass and brass go-go cage dance party to the stars. Going up, I want to hear hypoallergenic telestar music, untouched by human hands. Anything computer generated and played on a Moog synthesizer. I want to dance the Frug on a TWA commuter flight go-go dance party to the moon where cool dudes and chicks do the mashed potato under zero gravity and eat delicious snack pills. And so when they're up at the top of them, um, Brandy says, tell the world what scares you most. She gives us each an Aubergine Dreams eyebrow pencil and says, save the world with some advice from the future. Seth writes on the back of a card and hands the card to Brandy for her to read. On game shows, Brandy reads, some people will take the trip to France, but most people will take the washer-dryer pair. Brandy puts a big plumbago kiss on the little square for the stamp and lets the wind lift the card and sail it off towards the towers of downtown Seattle. Seth hands her another and Brandy reads, game shows are designed to make us feel better about the random useless facts that are all we have left of our education. A kiss and the card's on its way toward Lake Washington. From Seth, when did the future switch from being a promise to being a threat? A kiss and it's off on the wind toward Ballard. Only when we eat up this planet will God give us another. We'll be remembered more for what we destroy than what we create. Which I think is true except we won't get another chance. We've got one planet and we fucked it. We get just a little one liner. What's the word for the opposite of glamour? And I realise I don't know. So let's find out. Hey Google, what's an antonym for glamour? Sorry, I don't understand. Okay. 
So Brandy uh, gives our narrator little hats with veils and big hats with veils, pancake hats and pillbox hats edged all around with clouds of tulle and gauze, parachute silk or, or heavy crepe or dense net dotted with chenille pom-poms. The most boring thing in the entire world, Brandy says, is nudity. The second most boring thing, she says, is honesty. Think of this as a tease. It's lingerie for your face, she says. A peekaboo nightgown you wear over your whole identity. The third most boring thing in this entire world is your sorry ass past. And just I like this, I mean I'm not religious at all, um, but I just thought this was quite telling. Jumped to once a long time ago, Manus, my fiancé who dumped me, Manus Kelly, the police detective. He told me that your folks are like God because you want to know they're out there and you want them to approve of your life. Still, you only call them when you're in crisis and need something. And so our narrator, um, her friend Evie, wants her to house sit for her. Um, you need to feed my cat is all, Evie says. I don't like being alone so far out from town, I write. I don't even know how you can live there. Evie says, it's not living alone if you keep a rifle under the bed. I write, I know girls who say that about their dildos. And Evie says, gross, I'm not that way at all with my rifle. Some more references to our, our parents. It reminds me of the, is it Larkin who wrote, they fuck you up, your mum and dad. Anyway. Uh, Seth says how your being born makes your parents God. You owe them your life and they can control you. Then puberty makes you Satan, he says, just because you want something better. And we get the line of uh, wisdom here. The one you love and the one who loves you are never ever the same person. I mean, maybe sometimes they are if you're really lucky. Cracking little line here, uh, it's scary, but now when I see somebody blush, my reaction isn't, oh, how cute. A blush only reminds me how blood is under the surface of everything. Uh, interesting, I've tabbed out here. Manna saying, you know how your parents are sort of like God, sure you love them and want to know they're still around, but you never really see them unless they want something. And obviously that's a call back to that earlier quote, and I hadn't even noticed that at the time. I just tabbed it out as being like, oh that's a good quote, forgetting that I'd already tabbed out that thought, you know? Okay, so then we get a big twist, which you kind of see coming. Uh, it's basically that Brandy is our, our protagonist's brother. Um, and she says, I'm on drugs so it's alright if I tell you this. I have to tell you but I do love you. I can't tell how this is for you but I want us to be a family. My brother wants to marry me. Uh, and she, and uh, Brandy says she still has the original equipment so she could still make her pregnant. And basically Brandy and later we learn um, uh, the main character as well. They're making their decisions because they want to fuck up their life as much as possible. That's why they're doing it. Um, so we get here, a sexual reassignment surgery is a miracle for some people, but if you don't want one, it's the ultimate form of self-mutilation. Uh, she says, not that it's bad being a woman. This might be wonderful if I wanted to be a woman. The point is, Brandy says, being a woman is the last thing I want. It's just the biggest mistake I could think to make. Yeah, some more little bits of wisdom here. Your birth is a mistake you'll spend your whole life trying to correct. You spend your entire life becoming God and then you die. When you don't share your problems, you resent hearing the problems of other people. All God does is watch us and kill us when we get boring. We must never, ever be boring. But I think... If a god exists, he's definitely finding some exciting ways for people to die through, you know, the wars and stuff that get carried out in his name. Uh, and then we go back to how we started with this fire happening. Um, and the narrator says, It's the sweetest of moments when the fire takes control and you're no longer responsible for anything. And I thought that was, you know, I can kind of relate to that in a weird way. I'm not an arsonist. Um, but yeah. Kraken line, which is probably true. Go figure, but Texans seem to be a lot more comfortable around disastrous house fires than they are around anal sex. And so the idea was Brandy knew she was going to get shot and was wearing a bulletproof vest. Um, but they missed they missed the bulletproof part. Um, luckily, it hits her in one of her um, breasts, which uh, obviously she's had some work done. Um, anyway, we learn the final truth about what happened to our protagonist as well. Um, I'm not going to go into um, all of those details because I don't want to spoil it too much for you. But I thought this was this was kind of an interesting bit. And this harkens back to what I was saying earlier about um, Brandy having the sex change. Not because she felt that she was supposed to, you know, a man trapped in a woman's body or, or whatever it is. No, a woman trapped in a man's body. Um, but because she felt like it was the ultimate... Um, way of messing up her life if she didn't want it but had a sex change anyway. Uh, the truth is I was addicted to being beautiful and that's not something you just walk away from. Being addicted to all that attention, I had to quit cold turkey. I could shave my head but hair grows back. Even bald I might still look too good. Bald I might get even more attention. There was the option of getting fat or drinking out of control to ruin my looks but I wanted to be ugly and I wanted my health. Wrinkles and aging looked too far off. There had to be some way to get ugly in a flash. I had to deal with my looks in a fast, permanent way or I'd always be tempted to go back. 
and we have this line, find what you're afraid of most and go live there. And that sounds a lot like the um, Charles Bukowski quote of find what you love and let it kill you, except it's not Bukowski who said that, it was Kinky Friedman and he didn't say exactly that. I follow up with Charles Bukowski quote, uh, <laughs> Not Charles Bukowski gropes, although that does sound like the kind of thing you'd do. I follow a Charles Bukowski quotes group on uh, Facebook and the person who runs the page is very annoyed that people keep misquoting Bukowski with that find what you love and let it kill you. Even though I think it's the most Bukowski thing that Bukowski could possibly have said, he didn't say it. And so anyway, um, our, our protagonist Shannon, Shannon McFarland, um, she talks about um, what she sees in her future and I just thought this was an interesting point about amusement parks and the people they hire. I don't know if this is true but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but obviously she has this disfigured face so she's thinking about how she can make that work for her. Please don't come after me. Be the new centre of attention. Be a big success. Be beautiful and loved and everything else I wanted to be. I'm over that now. I just want to be invisible. Maybe I'll become a belly dancer in my veils. Become a nun and work in a leper colony where nobody is complete. I'll be an ice hockey goalie and wear a mask. Those big amusement parks will only hire women to wear the cartoon character costumes since folks don't want a chance a strange molester guy hugging their kid. Maybe I'll be a big cartoon mouse or a dog or a duck. I don't know but I'm sure I'll find out. There's no escaping fate, it just keeps going. Day and night, the future just keeps coming at you. Which I think is a nice thing to end on. So yes, Invisible Monsters, uh, oh, I said it like I used to say the word monsters. I trained myself not to say monsters, to say monsters. Invisible Monsters, because when I say monsters, which is what I used to say as a kid, people used to bully me. Anyway, Invisible Monsters by Chuck Paul and it. Um, cracking novel, I would give it a strong four out of five, edging towards 4.5 territory. Um, on a good day, maybe maybe I would have given it that. It's it's somewhere around there. Um, one of his better books. It's um, I probably enjoyed it more than Fight Club, um, but not as much as Rant. So take a make of that as you will. Invisible Monsters by Chuck Paul and it. Go and read it. So there we have it. That's what I made of Invisible Monsters by Chuck Paul and it. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.